Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. You've had such an interesting program so far. I think it says something about our great country that the issue that uh, has everybody's attention, the sexiest issue around, is the budget. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we're spending all day long on. It is important, as everybody here knows. Uh, and, and just to introduce this next discussion, uh, I think everybody's aware that since late last year, a small bipartisan group of senators has been working to try to forge a consensus agreement on how do we address the nation's long-term fiscal imbalances. Coming off the work of the Simpson-Bowles Commission, you heard from them a little earlier, this group has reportedly, they've been very careful about what they've said in public, but they've reportedly been talking about all issues, uh, including cutting entitlements, including uh, uh, spending uh, of, of a nature we're going to try to talk to them about now, and including tax increases. There's been a lot of speculation about what they've been doing. They've been remarkably uh, good, I would say, from their perspective in terms of not talking to the press. So it's, I think, a real uh, testament to the importance of this gathering today that they're prepared to come and talk to all of us uh, right now. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senators Saxby Chambliss, Mike Crapo, Dick Durbin, and Mark Warner. Senators, thank you very much, and I just, I just complimented you. Uh, as a reporter, normally we don't compliment uh, people for keeping things a secret, but, uh, but, his, but it has been remarkable the degree to which the work that you've done has been kept uh, under wraps. So I'm going to start with you, Senator Chambliss, because you and Senator Warner were sort of the, uh, the I guess, the two originals in this group, and it quickly expanded to include, uh, to include others. Let me start with you. Where does your work stand right now? We, we know that you had a sixth member uh, in, uh, in Senator Tom Coburn. He fairly publicly stepped away uh, last week. Uh, and today we were supposed to have Senator Conrad. He at the last minute had to be on the floor of the Senate uh, because of a Senate debate, the vote coming up at 5 o'clock. But, but give us a sense of, as of today, where do your discussions stand? Well, first of all, let me say, Judy, that the, the, what you mentioned is exactly right about the fact that we could have six senators sit in a room for almost six months in this town and uh, the contents of the discussion not get out. That's the way the Senate used to work, and our goal was to make it work that way from day one, and these folks have just been tremendous to work with. We've talked about a lot of sensitive issues, obviously. And um, this issue in and of itself is so complex that every time we would reach a point of mutual common ground on one issue, then something else would pop up. And that happened during the course of all of this. And at times, all of us became frustrated, but we always came back together. Uh, unfortunately, Senator Coburn made the decision last Tuesday to exit the group and, as he said, take a break. Uh, I'm not um, uh, giving up hope that Tom's going to come back. And this needs to be a bipartisan agreement if we're able to reach one, and we have gotten close. And uh, we're very hopeful that at the end of the day, Senator Coburn's going to rejoin our group, but I can't say when that's going to be. Senator Durbin, uh, you've been uh, a, a member of this group uh, from the outset. What do you, how hard has it been for the six of you to sit there, three Republicans and three Democrats, to talk about these issues? It has not been hard. Uh, I think we like one another, and that helps. We have a different point of view on some issues, and we've tried to work through them. It almost sounds like a legislative process, uh, and it's something that we want to encourage, and I hope that if we can move forward from where we are today, that it'll be a model for our colleagues uh, to join us toward a solution. I know what the alternative is, as the majority whip in the Senate, with 53 members needing 60 votes, I can tell you that it's a very difficult task unless you have bipartisan cooperation. With a divided Congress between the House and the Senate, it's obvious as well. So it, it has been difficult on an issue basis not difficult on a personal basis. We've come to like one another, and we've shared a lot of popcorn. So, <laughs> Senator Crapo, 
is everything really on the table? I mean, we've been told it's spending in all its forms and it's taxes, revenues. Is that the case? Well, yes, everything is on the table. Everything has to be on the table. That does not mean, however, that we are not engaged in the difficult process of crafting the compromises that can deal on a comprehensive basis with a paradigm shift in America's fiscal policy in a way that can get 60 votes on the floor of the Senate. That means some things will not be on the table in the end after they've been negotiated out, or they will be negotiated into a form that was different than most people were looking at them. But absolutely, everything has to be on the table. And I was listening to, uh, to the earlier discussion about tax policy, which you referenced. And uh, frankly, uh, I, for one, agree that we need to have very significant tax reform. We need to change the paradigm in America from continuing to debate over whether to raise taxes and on whom, or whether to cut taxes and, and how that plays out, and instead focus on developing a tax code that will be more competitive globally for our businesses, will be more fair, less complex, and less expensive to comply with. And that will be a huge part of the solution. And Senator Warner, the reason I'm asking, I want to press a little bit more on whether everything's on the table, because what one hears on the outside is that one party is implacably opposed to revenue increases, the other party implacably opposed to any sort of significant entitlement changes. So how is the dynamic inside your group any different from that? Well, Judy, let's, and this is reiterating what you all have talked about all day long, you know, but this is the most predictable financial crisis that we're approaching in our lives. And we have used government's traditional tools already. We've used monetary policy. We've used fiscal stimulus. We shot those bullets already. So I feel kind of like the country or the Congress is Thelma and Louise in that car heading for that cliff. And we uh, felt like somebody needs to put the brake on. Somebody needs to say, let's not drive over the cliff, figure this out. There are ways. And you know, we took the Simpson-Bowles report as a starting point, where you can cut tax rates, look at tax spending, government spending by a different name, as Governor Daniel said, tax expenditures, cut back on those, generate revenue, and actually, for folks like Dick and Kent and I, maintain or improve the progressivity of our, of our tax system. There are equal ways on some of this stuff that's just math. With an aging society and with increasing medical technology, the notion of how we make our entitlement promises keep them in a fiscally sustainable way, we've just got to grapple with. I mean, and this is one, and let me just speak for myself, you know, Social Security doesn't contribute to the deficit. We don't think it, you know, it, but it, the idea that it's on a sustainable path just isn't true. I mean, Bismarck was the guy that set 65 as the retirement age when he was premier of Germany when life expectancy was mid-50s. Wasn't a bad deal if you outlived the actuarial tables. But with aging population, with 17 workers for every one retiree in 1950, three for every one now, we've got to make sure the promise of Social Security is there. So I think there is a real, and one of the things, I'm a new guy, but these, these senators, and Kent Coburn, and or Kent Conrad, and Tom Coburn, you know, I, I found that there was a willingness to discuss everything on an intellectual basis, to kind of check your partisan hats. And I still believe in terms of a comprehensive approach that this is the, the, this is the best possibility. If we can start with a bipartisan group in the Senate, that's the way to move forward, not just in terms of a short-term debt extension, but in terms of a comprehensive plan. Senator Chambliss, you've said that you all are working off of the, uh, the, the Simpson-Bowles Commission report. Why not just adopt that report like it is? Well, it's easy to say you want to just take that report and put it into legislative language, but the fact is there, there were several options in the Simpson-Bowles plan on different issues. And um, we've had to go through and we've had to look at those options, decide which one we think is best, number one, but at the same time decide which one of those options we think is going to get 60 votes. Uh, because we can go through all of this exercise and we can take all these arrows that we've been taking for the last five months and if we don't develop a product that's going to get 60 votes then we haven't gotten anywhere. 
And um, the, the overall concept of Simpson Bowls is a very good foundation to build on. And I think all four of us, as well as Tom and Kent, would say that we've taken Simpson Bowls and even improved it in some areas. Uh, because you want to give we, us an example? Uh, no. <laughs> I think what we've, we've we, looked at ways you can actually get it passed. Yeah, we've, I mean, we've taken some specific areas of, of the reform package, whether it's revenues, where we're, uh, we look at it as not increasing taxes, but increasing revenues. And anybody that thinks that we're going to repay this $14 trillion debt we owe, and by the way, even though we're down to five, that $14 trillion is still owed. So when we say we're continuing to work, that's why we're continuing to work. But anybody that thinks that we're going to solve it simply by cutting 12 to 14 percent of the budget really isn't thinking seriously about this. And that 12 to 14 percent is the discretionary uh, portion of the budget. Um, that's why everything has to be on the table, as Mike alluded to earlier. And we have taken the plan and we have expanded it and we think and, um, uh, made it better from the standpoint of both the spending reduction, both from the standpoint of reforming the entitlements as well as looking at the revenues. And while we're reducing tax rates a la Ronald Reagan, we're going to increase revenues a la Ronald Reagan. Uh, it's exactly the same sort of approach that was taken back then. We know it worked then, and we know it can work again without raising tax rates. And that's been a key ingredient that we've had to work through that does change Simpson Bowles a little bit. Is that changing loopholes, closing loopholes, Senator Durbin, and what else? Well, this commission, Bowles Simpson, finally opened a door which had remained closed in most of these conversations tax expenditures, the tax code, $1.1 trillion per year, deductions, credits, loopholes, exclusions, you name it. $1.1 trillion also equals the total amount collected each year in personal income tax in America. It is a significant amount of money. And what we have said, what was said in the commission, what we continue to say is it is a worthy exercise for the appropriate committees and members of Congress to sit down and make some value judgments. Are all of these things important for the future and growth of America? In my, from my point of view, some of them are not. Some of them are. What Bull Simpson said is if you eliminated all of them, if you eliminated the entire tax code, and then took the savings, 1.1 trillion, and dedicated anywhere from 80 billion to 180 billion dollars a year, then took the rest and dedicated it to reducing marginal tax rates, you would have a dramatic decrease in the marginal tax rates of Americans, 40% or more in many instances. So here's the question. Is it more important to you to have a marginal income tax rate, 40% less, if you can't have a complete mortgage interest deduction as you have it today? Good question, right? I think it's an important policy question. Maybe that isn't the place we go to make the change, but at least let's go through the exercise to find out how we can reduce rates in a progressive manner, remember where I said on the spectrum, reduce rates in a progressive manner, and at the end of the day, have more economic growth and rid the tax code of things that frankly should have been gone a long time ago. Senator Crapo, is that the kind of thing that, that you can come to agreement on? Well, again, <clears throat> yes, depending on what the outcome is, and that's why the hard work of working through the various compromises that have to be made is so critical. Uh, again, I come back to the point that one of the most important and powerful parts of the Fiscal Commission's deliberations and outcome was the change in paradigm with regard to looking at revenue. As uh, we have already heard from Richard, the fact is that we will have a debate and we will promote a debate with our activity about just exactly where in the tax code should we make the adjustments and how much should those adjustments be and how should they work out. But the bottom line is we are committed to creating a tax code that is flatter, broader, and has a much lower set of tax rates that will not result in increases of taxes for American citizens and ultimately will generate a phenomenally more powerful economic engine that is critical. It's absolutely critical to be one of the pieces of the solution to our fiscal problems. Do I hear, Senator Warner, just this discussion of the last few minutes, that maybe the revenue side may end up being easier than the 
entitlement side. Well, let's again, you, I'm sure this stat has been thrown out today. But, you know, spending's at 25% of GDP, all time high. Revenues are roughly 15.3%, 60 year low. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that Delta can't be continued. So you've got to have a mix, and we think how you can get a tax code that will be fairer, flatter, progressive, that will generate revenue. And most of the times we've balanced over the last 80, 100 years, they've generally been in that 19.5 to 20.5% range, revenues and, and spending. How you can cut back on some of the, the entitlement programs, make them sustainable, have that safety net. And let me assure you, Dick Durbin sometimes you know, uh, uh, has been very aggressive at making sure that, the, as Mitch Daniels said, the purpose of government in terms of taking care of those who are most in need get protected. And I think we, you know, we have made so much more progress than, than most have assumed. And on top of that, I think what we've also worked through, or at least thought through, is how do you then take this idea? There's a lot of ideas floating around, but how do you then actually get a process that could get it through the Senate and again get it through the House and get it signed by the President? And one thing you have to remember, too, when we're talking about revenues, we're talking about reforming a tax code to make the corporate side much more competitive for corporations around the world. And right now, with uh, Japan doing what they've done recently, the United States stands to be the, um, uh, have the highest corporate tax rate of any industrialized country. That's not right. Um, and by using the same approach on the corporate side as we've referenced on the personal side, we can lower those corporate rates down to something that uh, is really meaningful and significant and will put corporations in America in a position to, to uh, also broaden that base by stimulating the economy and adding jobs. And that's, that was the purpose of Simpson Bowles, and, and that's been our purpose also. So that you gain revenue from the corporate, from the corporate revenue side, well, or that it's revenue neutral? On the corporate side, it's intended to be revenue neutral. Senator Durbin, what about that? Well, here's the way I see it. We have a nominal corporate income tax rate, and then we have an actual corporate income tax rate. And depending on your sector in the economy, if you are a small business, you're probably closer to the actual stated corporate income tax rate. If you are a larger company, as we learned with General Electric not too long ago, you may have a zero corporate tax rate. So the tax code rewards certain sectors of our business and their taxes are much lower. I think what we're trying to achieve is to try to create an opportunity for economic growth here by lowering the marginal corporate rate, doing it in a fair fashion so that at the end of the day we don't give up on the revenue that comes in from the corporate side. I mean, that, that is what we're wrestling with here. It isn't easy. But I think it's a reasonable thing to do. I'll say one other thing if I can. I don't know if you want to get into it at this moment, Judy. The entitlement discussion is important to all of us. And maybe I've had the most to say in this group about it uh, uh, when it comes to what I'm trying to do. I really honestly believe there has to be a safety net in America. There are vulnerable people in this country who will be vulnerable because of the economy, because of their status in life and the like. And there is more vulnerability today among many people because of two things. The first of which is the disparity in income, where many people are working harder and falling further behind. And the second is the uncertainty of their future. Savings took a hit not that many years ago. Pensions fell by the wayside in bankruptcy proceedings. And so when people talk about Social Security, it isn't about some program dating back to Franklin Roosevelt, it is literally their safety net. And it, they get very nervous when they hear us talking about it. I happened to be around in 83 when we went through the bipartisan exercise and extended Social Security. What was interesting, when it was done on a bipartisan basis, clearly to save Social Security, it didn't cost either party a seat in the next election. It wasn't an issue. Charlie Stenholm's in the front row over here, he remembers that. It really wasn't an issue because we'd done it in a bipartisan fashion, and we did it for the good of Social Security. Well, Senator Chambliss, is that the kind of discussion at that level that you're having in, in the group, or is, has it gotten more granular than that? I mean, are you still having these philosophical discussions? Well, obviously, you can't have a discussion about uh, the policy without getting philosophical, but we've gotten beyond that. Um, I mean, 
We know where Dick's coming from, let me tell you. We, we've had some pretty strong philosophical <laughs> arguments there. We, we know where um, uh, Tom Coburn, who's probably on the other extreme, uh, is coming from. Um, but we've been able to sit there and get beyond those philosophical arguments, say, okay, uh, we know where you are, Dick, or we know where you are, Tom, but look, guys, we, we got to we got to figure out some way to find the common ground on, on whether it was entitlements or whether it's revenue policy or what. And, and again, I go back to what I said initially. I, it's the way the Senate was designed to work, and I'm very proud to be associated with guys because it has worked. And Even though Saxby may have just called me an extremist. Uh, <laughs> I want to say extremism in the pursuit, well, no, I'll leave it at <laughs> <laughs> Senator Crapo, uh, while you're doing this, uh, you know, Senator Chambliss a minute ago used the word arrows. Y you and he and Senator Coburn in particular, not to say the Democrats haven't been taking some arrows too, but in particular you've taken some arrows on your side from uh, those who believe that taxes just should not happen. And, uh, you know, I think of Grover Norquist, Americans for Tax Reform, there are other names I could mention. Are you truly able to function ignoring all that? that uh, opinion out there and, and that is making itself known to you on a regular basis? Well, let me tell you, Judy, when we first voted for the Fiscal Commission report, the knives came out, right, Dick? And they haven't gone back in since. I mean, the fact is that when you are seriously talking about reforming the entire fiscal paradigm of the United States of America at a time of fiscal crisis like that which we face, uh, we're talking about everything literally being on the table and being open for discussion. And the groups that uh, I think sometimes like to create conflict, but uh, whether that's right or wrong, uh, the groups that have an interest in the outcome of these phenomenally broad number of issues are uh, engaged. And I would say that the uh, arrows is a polite way to put it, the, the attacks uh, have been on both sides intense. Nevertheless, we can get past that. And, and frankly, I think a lot of these groups are going to be pretty happy when they see the ultimate outcome because a lot of the fears they have are not as real as the product that we are working on. The bottom line here is that we have to continually remember that the status quo is also an option. It's not a good option. And in fact, uh, I think that it's probably the worst option of any of the options that we have in front of us as a nation. But as Americans understand that, then they become much more willing to engage in the, in the serious kind of discussion that we've had in this group that has helped to find ideas. And what we've found is that thinking outside of the box, if you will, or working on new paradigms, we can find ways to achieve the objectives that we have across a political spectrum in ways that will provide popular support and political support. Well, I want to pursue that because there are folks out there saying, well, it's great for the six of you or the five of you to be working on this, but in the political the real political world, it's going to be very difficult to turn what you do into real legislation. Well, Jim, so how do you well, remember, Jim, how do you look at that? Look at some of the markers out there. Yeah. We had 64 senators a number of weeks back who kind of said, atta boy, stay at it, you guys. You know, you'd be surprised at the number of senators who are viewed as one end or the other of the political extreme who've said to every one of us individually, stay at this. Because what is the alternative? The alternative is you know, the potential of a debt crisis without the tools that government has had in the past in terms of fiscal policy and monetary policy. Interest rates at traditional levels that would take an economy that is slowly starting to recover, but is recovering, to grind it to a halt at a time when you've got a potential another debt crisis in Europe, instability in the commodity markets, the notion that we wouldn't step up and, and try to put forward something that is transformative would just, you know, I said to Peggy Newton earlier, you know, the coalition government in the UK had a deeper problem and they have stepped up. Now we've got a different political system, but we would let the Brits outdo us? It's downright un-American. And I think there is enormous sense and where, it, I think as we found, Saxby and I have done a little bit of a roadshow uh, on this. You get outside the groups who want to preserve the status quo in this town, and Americans want to do their part, they want to be for something, as long as they feel like it's something that everybody's got some skin in the game. And a lot of the plans that have been put out there so far have been, accurately or not, portrayed as, you know, disproportionately 
one part of America versus another part of America bearing too much of the burden. I think the notion of what we are going to put out, or, or hopefully we can get to, is uh, something where everybody's going to have some skin in the game. And I think you'll have enormous amounts of folks step up. And you know, we've known from day one this was going to be a difficult process in and of itself, but even if we as a group of six were able to agree, selling it to our colleagues was going to be even tougher. So we, we've not had any um, complicated feelings about that. It's, um, it's always been understood that it was not going to be an easy sale, and that's why it's been so difficult to find the right kind of common ground. Um, and why it's been so difficult at the end, because in any negotiation, the, the major issues are always the ones you kind of put off till the end, and that's kind of uh, where we are, and that's why it got so difficult right at the end. So coming to the end, does that mean you're close to coming out with a, re with a report? I ask you because you've got the, the negotiations underway with Vice President being led by Vice President Biden, and you were just telling me there's discussion informal discussion between the two groups. Is that accurate? Well, yeah, it's very informal. I mean, I've kept John Kyle as well as Mitch McConnell apprised of where we are, not the details necessarily, but where we are in the process all the way through this from the very first day that Mark and I sat down together and uh, started visiting on this. Well, how is but, your track different from that track? Well, we're, we're not integrated with them at all other than the fact that you've got Democrats and Republicans sitting down at a table in that group, and obviously we are in our group, but, but what they have been focused on, um, as directed by the President, I think rightly so, is the debt ceiling vote, and what's it going to take to get 60 votes to, to raise the debt ceiling. We've always been more focused on the long-term issue, because right. they're not going to solve the $14 trillion debt. Uh, I, I don't think there's any way. Um, that's what we have had our, our sights on from, from early on. So how do you see your timetable? How do you see this unfolding uh, going forward? Hey, I mean, I think all four of us would like to sit here today and tell you that come next week we're going to roll out this plan that everybody's going to be totally happy with. But uh, number one, we're not there. And secondly, when we get to that point, and we still hope we will, um, it's going to be a plan that everybody is going to dislike in some respects because all of America is going to have to share in the sacrifice if we're truly going to get this debt under control and address what Mike Mullen, the ch uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, said is the number one national security interest of our country and, and uh, that is to start paying down this debt. As, as uh, Mark referenced a minute ago, we got spending up here and we've got revenues down here, we've not only get, got to get it in balance, we've got to get revenues above spending so that we can start paying that mortgage. If we don't do that, then we're not going to show the good faith in the marketplace that the people that buy our bonds are going to uh, require us to show. So it's, um, it's going to be um, a difficult process at best to convince folks of it. And we're not there yet, and we can't say that we're going to be there next week or the week after, but we're going to continue to, to dialogue about Senator it. Senator Durbin, are you convinced, I'm going to ask each one, of you convinced that you can sell the rest of the Senate uh, on, uh, on what you come up with? We don't know until we try. And at this point, I think we'll all say this. We're receiving encouragement from both political parties not to quit, because I think people have seen the alternative. They, they, they know what happened when we debated the continuing resolution and came close to closing down government. They know what will happen if we don't address some of these debt issues in the near term and longer term. And they don't want us to quit. They may not agree, as Saxby and Mark and Mike have all said, they may not agree with our particulars, but they understand that our process is the only hope, a bipartisan process where people are giving on both sides and trying to reach a common goal. Uh, putting aside our own politics, Democrats and Republicans, and trying to see what's good for this nation. That's what Simpson Bowles Commission was all about. Eleven out of eighteen of us voted for it on a bipartisan basis. That's that's a pretty good thing. We wouldn't be sitting here on the stage, it isn't likely, without the good work they had done. I think it, there would be a gathering at the river at some point, Judy. I'm not sure when. Uh, I hope there will be. And I will tell you that when it comes to Vice President Biden and even the President, they have been encouraging to us without knowing the details in particular 
because they think that we're we're going to add a voice, a positive voice, to the ultimate solution of this problem. The reason I'm challenging or questioning you on this, Senator Crapo, is because we see what difficulty the Congress has had dealing with short-term budget challenges. This one <laughs> is far bigger than that over a long period of time, and I'm just wondering well, you ask where does your confidence come from? First of all, you know, you ask a question both on where's the confidence and, and but also on the, the timetable. Uh, if you think about it, I, I probably, as my colleagues have, have been asked a hundred times, if I, I've been asked once, uh, when are you going to put out a plan or when will you reach finality? And I keep saying, you know, we will reach finality when we get a deal and we are making progress and we are, we are truly uh, doing something that I haven't seen done in the United States Senate for a long time and that is to sit down as Republicans and Democrats and try to bridge the differences between our parties and our politics and America's politics on the most phenomenally broad-based issues of our time. We are dealing with everything from Social Security to the entitlement system, Medicare and Medicaid, to the spending structure on our discretionary, discretionary side of our budget, to our revenue system, defense, and including defense, and the mechanism to enforce that to stop Congress from getting around it, which it historically does. And this we're trying to do on a basis that develops bipartisanship. So I guess my answer to your question as to how do we find the confidence to go forward is in the response that we get from not only our colleagues but from people across the country. I said a minute ago that the knives were out, and they are. The special interest groups across this country are ready to fight any proposal to change the status quo, and they're geared up. But at the same time, I can't tell you how many times every day I'm contacted by people who say, don't quit. Don't quit because we're counting on you. And, and Senator Warner, that one other point, I, Senator Coburn wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post last week where he talked about the work of this group, but he said this really ought to be done by the entire Senate. Could this work be done by now, the entire Senate? Clearly, if, if and when we get to that point, the entire Senate, this isn't going to happen unless the entire Senate or 60 plus say, yes, obviously whatever we would put out would change, but you know, we think that we have to make this, if, one of the things that we felt all along, if you do this sequentially and take this in bite size, the forces of the status quo will stop it. You've got to roll this in so that everybody kind of at some point says, I don't like that part, but the sum of the greater good here is we're going to all leap together. Because my fear is that what, what came out, as Dick said, of the potential government shutdown a few weeks back, which I was frankly embarrassed about, was a growing lack of sense. You know, our institutions up to the challenge. So as important as this debt and debt crisis is, and I think there's nothing that's more important, I think there's also the fact that we've got to reaffirm that our institutions can take on these big jobs and get something done. And the only way the idea that there's going to be a one-party only solution to this is just plain wrong. And I think we will and do have that chance to be that, that starting point. And I think we're going to surprise a lot of folks and uh, we're going to need all the folks who've been involved with the Peters Institute and others who care about this issue to not hang back. You can't just come and be part of the audience and listen. We're going to need you to say, be out there urging. And if you're a Democrat, go support a Republican who's supporting this. If you're a Republican, go support a Democrat. Because this really is, it's not our kids' future anymore, it's our future. The imminency of this challenge is something that we've got to step up, and I think it's our job to, to at least get that ball started. And, and these guys have been the ones who've done it. In closing, Senator Chambliss, so how will we know when you're about to <laughs> announce something? You come to work with asbestos suits on, or what? White smoke, <laughs> white smoke. <gasps> Well, uh, you know, there's no, um, uh, there's no timetable that we have. This was not begun as, well, we're going to get this done for the CR, or we're going to get something rolled out to uh, have a vote by the time the debt ceiling vote takes place. Our statement has consistently been that we're going to roll this out when we get it right. And uh, that may be next week. I would hope eventually Senator Coburn will join our group and the six of us will be able to roll it out sometime soon, but, uh, but we don't know. Well, that's a tantalizing answer. This is the first time all of the senators have come together. Uh, four of the five senators have come together to, uh, to talk publicly, so we are especially appreciative. 
Senator Chambliss, Senator Warner, Senator Crapo, Senator Durbin. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.